Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 264, and I had a conversation with B. Jeffrey Madoff. No relation. I feel like that's important to say right off the top. Uh, He is the founder of Madoff Productions. I'm just going to read off of his bio because it says it way better than I could. Based in New York City, his company collaborates with ad agencies, public relations firms, and directly with clients to produce commercials, branded content, and live streaming events. And I got to tell you, you got to go check out his website, which I put links to on heyhumanpodcast.com. It's so cool. You see all the Victoria's Secret stuff and uh, Ralph Lauren stuff, and it's very, very cool. Uh, He began his career as a fashion designer. Uh, He was chosen as one of the top 10 designers in the United States, then switched careers to this film and video production. His... His content has won awards. Uh, he has documentaries, web content around the world. As I mentioned, Ralph Lauren, uh, Victoria's Secret, Tiffany, Radio City Music Hall, the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and so on and so on and so on. He works with private equity firms and investment banks. He's a true entrepreneur. He has a book that I read. It's quite good called Creative Careers, Making a Living with Your Ideas, which is on Amazon. He teaches at the Parsons School of Design in New York. Uh, The class is based on that book about creative careers. Uh, He's a playwright and a theater producer. His play Personality, the Lloyd Price musical, is based on the life of rock and roll Hall of Fame legend Lloyd Price, who just passed away, sadly. Uh, But the... The play, the musical, will be out in 2022, and it's very exciting. And so we talk about that a little bit. He's awesome. He has talked on all sorts of topics in all sorts of places. And since this episode, he and I have become friends, and he's delightful and funny. Really interesting guy, and I think you're going to enjoy this. Uh, We reference, well, he references a book. He says, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. I looked it up. The name of the book is Thinking Fast and Slow. So I just want to make sure y'all know the right title there. Uh, Daniel mm, Kenning, I think is how you pronounce it. Again, I put a link to that. We talk about all sorts of stuff. Obviously, we talk about entrepreneurship and his world and the things he's come up, uh, you know, how he's raised himself in the world of entrepreneurship and uh, content and branding and music and all this kind of stuff. But we also talk about some really interesting things, uh, including death. That, uh, that was an interesting part of the conversation that I was not anticipating. And it was quite something. I'm not sure. Oh, <laughs> I made a note for myself here. It says allergies. Now I know why. Uh, there, <laughs> My voice sounds like a frog in this episode. And it's, it's me with my allergies. So I apologize for any kind of bleating weird noises that I make. That is why. <laughs> I wrote this. I was like, allergies? What is that about? Uh, anyway. Uh, yeah. So that's all about... Jeffrey, uh, and I think you're going to enjoy it. It's a really fascinating life he has led. He's, he's a delightful human being, uh, really interesting, really bright, and as I said, very funny. Okay, usual stuff. Hey Human Podcast can be found on Facebook and Instagram under Hey Human Podcast. Uh, if you want my personal socials, it is Susan Ruthism, S U S A N R U T H I S M, and that can be found on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. You can, as I mentioned before, go to the links page on heyhumanpodcast.com where you will find links for every episode on every guest. So you don't have to do any of the work. You just go there and you find all the stuff that we talk about and take you down the rabbit hole that way. Also is the storefront. If you want to support Hey Human Podcast, a great way to do it is merch. And you can find t-shirts and hats and all sorts of merchy merch things. Check that out as well. You can email me, susan at heyhumanpodcast.com. Uh, if you want to know more about me in general, go to susanruth.com. So many websites, so little time. And you can sign up for the mailing list on susanruth.com also. If you like music, check out Susan Ruth on iTunes and also on Spotify. But if you're on iTunes, you're more likely to buy the or download the record. So that's where I tell you to go. And my most recent album from a couple of years ago is called All I Ever Wanted Was Everything. 
if you're looking for a, a linear album of events. Uh, I think that's about it. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps. It's a great way to support the podcast. And I would appreciate it. So there's that too. Okay, that's about it. Thank you for listening. I'm excited for this episode. And I made a new friend, which is always exciting too. Uh, Be well, be kind, take care of each other. Here we go. Jeff Mattoff, welcome to Hey Human. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's. I want to start with you growing up. Where are you? You're from Wisconsin, or you just happened to go to school in Wisconsin? I went to school in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin in Madison. I grew up in Akron, Ohio. Oh, okay. Go Buckeyes, right? Is that Buckeyes? Yeah, it is very good. Go Buckeyes. Oh my gosh, but, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> that's. Uh, you now know as much as I do about Ohio State sports. Uh, and uh, also, a lot of music came out of Akron. You know, Chrissy Hind was actually two classes behind me at Firestone High School in, in Akron, Ohio. Wow. And uh, this is funny. One of my dear friends, uh, I called him up. This is probably 15 years ago. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and I said, Hey, I just found these CDs and loved them. And I'm reading the liner notes and I see it's your son. My friend is Jim Carney. His son is Patrick, the Black Keys. So, uh, and, I, and I love their music. I mean, they're, they're Me too. great. They're great. Absolutely. You know, it's like finding some 60s blues band, you know, yeah. and just two guys who just filled the space with cool music. Uh, so they're there and actually uh, Devo was from Akron too. So there just, is quite a music tradition there. Yeah, lead singer of Devo has an art gallery here in town that I went to before before the end of days. <laughs> and it was really fun. And I got to meet him, a uh, really lovely guy. And then uh, I used to work for an architecture firm in Nashville, Dade, and we built uh, Dan Arabeck's house. Oh, two really? Of them, actually. Yeah. It's a small world, really. Yeah, it's, 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 Crazy. And uh, I'll I'll share this with you. My son loves the Black Keys also. And so they were doing a concert in New York and Jim got us tickets and down at one of the piers. And it was, of course, sold out. And I called Jim from the concert and he said, are the seats okay?" And I said, yeah, it's great. But you know what's really cool? He said, what's that? And I said, I'm here with my son waiting to see your son go on stage and perform. That is cool. And it was. Yeah, that's a nice full circle moment. Yeah, really. Yeah. And that's a great concert also. (laughs) It was a great concert. And Jim and I have been friends since kindergarten. Wow. And we still are. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to find those kinds of friends that have been with you throughout your entire history. I'm fortunate because I have a few of those. Yeah. So what was childhood like growing up? What what was the family like? Were you, uh, was it a big family, little family? Was it focused on get out there and make something of yourself or was it more chill? Uh, Well, I was young when I was a kid. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, My parents were both entrepreneurs. They had retail stores in Akron. So I grew up in a household where I was very used to hearing my mom and dad talk about business and solicit each other's advice. And my, I have one sister, Janice, and and she's an entrepreneur. Uh, Mm -hmm. She's in retail like my parents were in South Carolina. And uh, I think, you know, you become an entrepreneur because you're basically unemployable. And that's why I did uh, and started my first business when I was quite young. But growing up, one of the things that was really great, and you you only know the household you grow up in. You don't really know what goes on in other households. But our place was the gathering place for friends because my parents were actually fun. You know, they weren't strict uh, and they didn't set up boundaries like children should be seen and not heard or any of that stuff, which uh, they encouraged me to do what I wanted to do. So like, because I had a retail store and I had the 
big rolls of craft paper that they would wrap packages in for shipping. Since I could draw, they would bring home big sheets of paper. And in my room, I could do anything I wanted, putting stuff up on the walls or whatever. So they were really encouraging. Uh, you know, it wasn't, there was no, you know, get a, have a fallback position for whatever you're going to do. And they just trusted me to find my own path and emotionally supported me in terms of whatever it is that I wanted to do. And I didn't realize when I was a kid how fortunate I was mm -hmm. to have parents who had that kind of an outlook, you know, and because all I knew was the world that I grew up in and the house that I grew up in. And, you know, when I got old enough to start looking back, you know, I realized that that was huge for me, you know, in terms of having the confidence uh, to do and pursue the things that I wanted to pursue. And you started out in fashion, but was that a draw for you in general, or did it seem like a, a sure bet considering you knew how to sketch and draw already? Uh, what it was, was I was uh, working in a small boutique in Madison. And, uh, and when I say a small boutique, I mean, a small boutique. And it was at that time, you know, at the checkout counter, you could also buy rolling papers and hash pipes, you know, and uh, we were at the base of this rooming house and uh, the wall behind the cash register where the stereo, remember stereos, uh, where the stereo was, we knew when somebody OD'd in the rooming house because as they fell down the stairs, the arm would skip across the record. So, you know, oh my God, <laughs> it was quite a place. But uh, another dear friend of mine who I don't remember not knowing, his mother and my mother grew up together. Uh, and he called me and said, Listen, uh, I've saved up some money. He graduated from college a year before I did. And uh, he said, Can you think of a gig that would earn more than bank interest? I said, Well, you know, I see what we sell in the store. I could always draw. I'll start a clothing company. I was clueless what it that actually meant. You know, as they say, youth is wasted on the young. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah. You know, I didn't really know what I was getting into. Uh, and I just thought it sounded like a good idea. And I was very naive. Uh, you know, I thought when I went into a store, I saw fabric on bolt. I thought that it was wholesale because it hadn't been made into anything yet, <laughs> you know, and I was very, very ignorant, but fortunately not stupid. And, you know, the difference is ignorant. You can learn stupid's forever, you know? That's right. And so I probably got the most valuable business lessons I could get because all these decisions that I was making were based on survival, <laughs> And yeah. ended up building a business and attracting serious financial backing and all of that sort of thing. So then you must have brought a sense of fearlessness to the table. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I never thought of it that way. I just, you know, was trying to figure out how to stay in business. I was growing the business. I mean, within a year and a half, I had about 110, 120 employees in two factories and an office in New York at the Empire State Building and, uh, and you know, salesmen around the country. And, you know, because it was just growing quickly. But I, I never thought of myself as fearless. You know, I thought of myself as I'm in business. Here's these opportunities. And, uh, you know, and you're kind of when you have a factory, for instance, which seemed like a good idea at the time. You also have to keep that factory busy, either with your own work or subbing out, subcontracting out other work. Uh, it's like a session musician, right? You know, it'd be great to be able to have your own band all the time, but most of the time that's not practical unless you're always busy and can keep them employed. Uh, and, you know, so I had considerable overhead, which was fine as long as my business was going well. Uh, and when we hit a recession, and stores were paying really slowly, you know, I had to do some really difficult things like laying off people 
I'm, you know, 22 years old, 23 years old, laying off people who had families. And, you know, I was very aware of the impact I was having on their lives, both good by giving them a job and bad when I had to lay them off because of cash flow and business reversals. So I learned a tremendous amount quite young. And I think that everything we do informs everything else we do. And so you learn from those experiences. Sometimes going through them isn't a lot of fun, but you do learn from those things. Absolutely. And you discovered along the way then, considering that you did not stay in that career path, that it wasn't for you. You weren't that thrilled about design anymore or what made you segue? Well, you know, it's, I enjoyed it. I, uh, when I moved to New York and my financial backer made it very clear to me that, you know, he was, in, he was investing in me because I provided employment for Wisconsinites. And he was a fifth generation Wisconsin person and owned five banks in my business. You know, all the employees banked at his banks and uh, he was a very good man. And, uh, but I wanted to leave Wisconsin and move to New York. And it was just time for me to do that. And I figured that money comes and goes, but time only goes. And I was fortunate, I think, to have some of that wisdom when I was pretty young. And, uh, you know, I, I had saved up enough money that if I lived frugally, which I did, I could survive for a year, explore other things. And then I started another business, another fashion company, because I had a good reputation. And uh, when I was doing that through one of the uh, fabric companies I bought from, the owner of the company uh, wanted me to meet his son, who was starting in the movie business. And he thought I had a good head on my shoulders. And since his son wouldn't listen to me, maybe he would listen to a contemporary because we're the same age. And that exposed me to the film business. And I found it fascinating. And I thought, wow, this could use more of the talents that I believe that I have in a more fulfilling and satisfying way. So I was very attracted to making that switch. Was it a good switch? Was it easy? Uh, Easy, I don't know. It was, um, yes, it was a good switch. And the part that I was certainly correct on was that it used, for me, it used my talents in a way that I found more appealing and gave me greater opportunity to express because I was involved in directing talent. And, you know, I learned how to shoot, learn how to edit, learn how to light. Uh, Writing came into the fold. Uh, Directing came into the fold. All of these things and collaborating with really talented people. But the interesting through line is the protocol, and I believe this is true in all businesses, that the protocol of the business of the business was the same designing a line of clothing as it was making a film, as it was writing a book, as it was writing a play and producing it. So a lot of times people look at what they do as really being siloed and they don't realize in a meaningful way that everything that you do uh, informs everything else that you do. And, uh, you know, coming up with a coming up with a line of fashion, you know, there's an idea it starts in your head. There's an idea you sketch it out and you sketch your line out and what the theme is and so on. And then you have to cost it out. You know, how much is it going to cost to make this? What kind of labor do we need? What kind of materials do we need? How long is it going to take to complete it? Then you have to deliver it. And of course, you have to bill for it and then you have to get paid for it. It was the same thing making a film. You know, you have to have your idea. You have to write down your idea. You have to communicate it to others. You have to figure out what's the labor cost, the equipment cost, the material cost. Uh, what's the deadline? Can I charge enough and still make a profit at the mm-hmm. end of it? And it's all the same thing. The universal you know. widget. Pardon? The universal widget. Well, that's right. That's right. I mean, if you're a dentist, that's the same thing. You know, what's it going to cost? You know, what are my costs and what can I charge to do this? And is there enough differential that I can hope to make a profit? So, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, most of us don't realize that 
because I think business has become shrouded in a certain mystique and mystery. But the reality mm-hmm. is kind of, you know, business is business. And uh, what I mean by that is there's protocols in business and knowing what your costs are and knowing how long it takes to do something and knowing most importantly, and I'm sure you deal with this in your, in your music career is knowing there's a market for what you're doing. Right. And then knowing how to shift into something else when that runs fallow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and it's funny because in when you're, creative, you know, people will say, and and again, thanks to my parents, they never did. But people would say, even friends of my family would say, well, what's your fallback position? And I'm thinking, you know, if I was going to be a dentist or an accountant, nobody would say, what's your fallback position? Well, you know, the music business, the film business, writing, it's a business and so it's and it's as serious a business as any other business if you hope to survive in it. So, uh, you know, I think that that notion of fallback position is you fall back on hopefully your own resourcefulness and savvy and survival skills to continue doing what you love doing. I saw that you graduated with a degree in psychology and philosophy, which to me is the perfect combination for knowing what another human wants, whether they know it or not. <laughs> well, and I was on the wrestling team. <laughs> so that, that helped physicalize the metaphor, so to speak. Uh, and, you know, I don't know that it taught me what people wanted. I didn't think about it that way. And that was before the term behavioral economics, which is the study of how we make decisions came about. That wasn't actually until 20 some years later. So we didn't talk about those kinds of things. But what I loved about philosophy and psychology, it is about, well, how do you think? Why do you believe what you believe? And, uh, you know, I tried to get a job as a sage when I graduated from college, but the wisdom factories were laying people off at that point. So I had to think of something else I could sell other than my my vast knowledge, you know, at 20 years old. Uh, But I'm really happy. You know, it's funny, a, a lot of the, we were talking earlier about friends and uh, that I have friends now, of course, their kids are grown up, uh, but there were, there were a lot of parents that were saying at that time, uh, and this is fairly recent, a lot of parents saying about, well, you know, what's the ROI on the education? You know, college is so expensive, which it is, education is too expensive, and that's a whole other topic, uh, but I think that there is an intrinsic value in knowledge and learning that one should pursue throughout their life. And uh, I am really happy that I had two highly impractical majors because it took me into spaces and ideas and ways of thinking that I would have never been exposed to if I went a more traditional route. Yeah, I'm, that's outside of the box. 101, 201, 401. <laughs> They're great skills to have as you navigate human contact. Well, and ideas. Tricky. <laughs> yeah. It is. It yeah. is. And that's and, and the human contact part uh, is not what they teach you in school. So you can learn all these principles getting your MBA in terms of how to read a balance sheet. And all of that kind of thing. But the people savvy that you need in business and how to navigate. uh, And when I started, you know, I teach at Parsons School of Design. And the course is called Creative Careers, Making a Living with Your Ideas, uh, which is also my book is titled that. And what I did was set up a course, the kind of course that I'd want to take myself. Uh, which would give me practical knowledge. What are the real obstacles that you run into in business? You know, how do you how do you how do you navigate in that world of business where there are going to be people that are going to try to screw you over? There are going to be personalities that you're going to have to deal with. And so, what are the real life examples of what you really confront when you're out there in the world? You know, it's not just I have a good product; it's being sold at a fair price. And, uh, 
you know, here's, here's what it is for X amount of dollars. You're dealing with people all the time. Collaborations. How do you have a fruitful collaboration? You know, how do you make things work? And you're not taught that in school. They don't teach you the people skills that are so necessary in order to survive in business. Is it tricky to take students who likely grew up staring out the window and hone those skills? Well, you know, I I happen to believe that there are no boring topics, but there are boring teachers. And I didn't want to be a boring teacher. And so to me, the principal thing, just like you as an entertainer and, and teaching is a form of entertainment, it's a form of performance, uh, is that you want to engage your audience. So how do you do that? And, and you know, that's, that's the challenge is, you know, because people relate to stories. They don't relate to facts. Decisions are made emotionally. They're not made rationally in almost all cases. And so, you know, that's really the engagement mm-hmm. factor and how you do that through storytelling, I think, is what's what's essential about it. And I think that that's universal. So the people staring out the windows, I was, uh, I was pretty good at getting them to pay attention because I also didn't wait for students to raise their hands. You know, I would say, you know, Susan, what, what, what did you think of that? You know, and I try to get people engaged because a lot of people are just reluctant to speak. Mm-hmm. But then when they realize that they won't burst into flames or die <laughs> if they open their mouth, and I think that makes the class better for everybody. The creative introvert, that's a, quite a combo. <laughs> well, or just, or just the person who is, uh, there are some people that are shy. There are some people that are introverts. Uh, and, you know, when you try, which I do in my classes, to make it feel like a safe space. And, you know, I certainly am willing and do uh, make a fool of myself. <laughs> and and joke around and do things that are kind of nuts in the classroom sometimes. Like, uh, I'll give you a real world story. Uh, I walked into the class and they're all talking amongst themselves. And I took one of the molded plastic chairs and I threw it across the room. It hit the wall, then hit the floor really loud. And the students were like, oh. You know, and it shocked them. And I said, so what did I do other than just throw a chair across the room? And there, some of them were still shaking. And, uh, and I said, think about our last class. What did I just do? And the last class was on advertising. And then somebody, I saw the light go on and I said, you got our attention. I said, that's right. I got your attention. So now what do I have to do? And somebody okay. else said, that's right. Exactly right, Susan. Keep it. And so that, you know, thing that I had not planned on doing when I walked into the class, but when they were all talking amongst each other and all that, I thought, oh, this could work. And uh, and it fortunately did. And it led to a really good discussion about, you know, it's easy to get people's attention. You make a big noise. But then how do you keep people's attention and keep them engaged? And that requires a whole other talent. Yeah, absolutely. When people come to you, so you have a whole production company that and you've dealt with brands and, and advertising. Uh, when I, I watched, there's a video on your website. I watched all that. It's quite flashy and lovely. Uh, when people come to you, I'm sure they have an idea of who and what they are. Uh, it, do you find it easy to mold that into something bigger? Because you're seeing things, I imagine, down the line. You're, you're already from A to Z, and they may be only to M in who they are. Well, you know, it depends on the, on the nature of the job. But, you know, I think that there's, some, there's a difference between giving people or selling people what they want and selling people what they need. So, you know, the goal of every business is to do more business, you know, to somehow reinforce their brand image, <clears throat> increase sales or that kind of thing. So, you know, I, I'm, 
do feel that I'm quite good at coming up with ideas that are consistent or help define their brand, but uh, also that will get the attention of an audience, you know? So uh, we did a project, this is some years ago for Victoria's Secret, and they were promoting a, uh, but you might've seen this on, on my website. Uh, they had a gift with purchase, which was an umbrella. They had never done advertising for their gift with purchase and they wanted to drive traffic to the stores. So they said to me, can you think of something interesting to do with an umbrella? I said, yeah. And they said, what? I said, well, give me a minute. You know, I don't know. I'll think of something. And so I thought of, uh, I had just seen Hamilton and loved it. And uh, I thought, well, you know, what could be cool is set this to music. No words at all. Really cool imagery, really cool dance and make it kind of look like a combination. If you know who Bob Fosse was, but his great choreographer and Busby Berkeley, who made these really cool looking musical numbers for MGM films. He directed these extravaganzas. You can see the overhead shot with kaleidoscopic legs as the dancers. And so uh, I told him I would, I would do a musical spot. And uh, that it would feature the umbrella and it would just look really cool. And then at the end, we could say, you know, gift with purchase at the end of it. Anyhow, they, we did it. And uh, coincidentally, I hired the associate choreographer from Hamilton and uh, Stephanie Clemens who did a fantastic job. We had a blast doing it. And it was the most successful campaign Victoria's Secret had ever done around that. So they just came in. Now, here's the here's the thing is I had been working with them for years before that. So they trusted me and trust every business is in the trust business. You know, so why should they trust me with their money, with their models, with their budgets, with all of that kind of thing? Uh, so I had established my credibility with them by delivering good work in the past. So they were also more open to my ideas because my ideas had worked in the past, but I always try to go in and bring value to the client in terms of what I'm doing. Cause I know why they're there and I know what they're looking for. To me, Victoria's secret has always had a very fascinating ad campaigns. I mean, you've got underpants and bras and I mean, hot chicks. I mean, that's a no brainer, but to, to then shape it into say the angels, program victoria's secret angels was genius to take this saucy seductress and then make her into a saintly being that's a great juxtaposition i don't know how saintly uh but the idea of angels i mean you know oh uh, it was a great idea uh because that's how we pull as humans we are we have our shadow side and our uh and our light side and i think I think it played into all of that. You know, I, to me, advertising is, a, is just trying to mirror you back at yourself. That's, that's, it's trying to convince you that you are the thing or you are the person that needs the thing. So I could, a, a middle-aged woman in, in America in Kansas watching or looking at a Victoria's Secret ad, she sees herself in that because she's like, well, I'm a little bit angel and I'm a little bit devil. And I don't know. I love the idea of it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that Victoria's Secret, which hit a major wall a couple of years ago. Yes, it uh, yeah, you know, I, I because as you have to, as a brand, be ready to evolve with your market, mm-hmm. and you know that's that's a critical thing, and that market includes a greater range of body types, a more more diversity among the models. And, and I have to say f- to Victoria's Secret's credit, they often had one of the most diverse runways when they did their shows. Uh, and they were, they were earlier to that game than many, but they had one body type and, yeah. and, you know, I think as the consumer got not only more sophisticated in some sense, uh, but because social media 
created a megaphone to talk back to brands. It wasn't just a one-way conversation anymore. Then you've got to evolve. And the worst thing you can do is dig your heels in. Uh, and I think that, you know, there are very good brands that had very good ideas, but those ideas began to creak a little bit. And you have to realize that ideas need to evolve. And, Absolutely. And, and the consumer having been empowered, I, I imagine that's changed quite a lot of advertising along the way. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's really interesting because brands are now expected to state their purpose and mission. And that, you know, I think something radically changed in 2016, and you began to see the first indications of it on the Super Bowl, you know, and, and what I mean by that, uh, that's when there was inclusion became a big thing. And that immigration policy became a big thing. And the country had become even more divided after the 2016 election. What you saw happening, which uh, I find absolutely fascinating, was what was the final taboo in advertising. That boundary was not only crossed, it was shattered. And what I'm talking about is that brands notoriously stayed away from politics or controversial subjects. They, they just felt, you know, why alienate half their market? You know, if you're Nike, half of your market doesn't believe in what the other half does. And I want to sell running shoes to everybody, right? Right. <clears throat> but Nike, with uh, their commercials, Colin Kaepernick in particular, took a political stand. And they took this political stand that initially cost them. Their yes. stock dropped and they had a choice to make. And that choice was like, do you remember the Pepsi commercial with Kendall Jenner? I do. Okay, like a staggeringly lame commercial that was so tone deaf and yes. stupid. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, they abandoned that within the first 24 hours. And that all that media money, all the production that was spent, all the cost that, you know, fees of Kendall and everything else, all that was down the drain. And they were having to do damage control. Uh, so they backed off their message right away. And I'm sure their intent was good, but uh, they didn't have anybody from the outside. The wrong voices were in the room and they didn't include any of those voices that could have said, you know, this is really hokey and stupid, and it's going to be offensive to a large part of your market, and especially younger people who are more tuned into this sort of thing, don't do it. And, you know, it's always amazing to me how some decisions, really bad decisions, get made, <laughs> you know. So, uh, you know, Nike, on the other hand, stuck with it. Now, I'm sure that they They're had They're on 50... the right side of history. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's right. That's right. <clears throat> Being but on the I right think, side of history helps, I think. <laughs> yeah, but you don't know that initially. <laughs> I know, know. You know, there's funny about the Nike thing that really struck me was, for me, it's, it, it did, wasn't a, I understand it's been politicized, but to me, that was a human issue. The fact that that has even become a politic issue was mind boggling. Well, you know, unfortunately, look at what has happened with face masks and vaccinations. You know, I know. I mean, uh, wearing a face mask is about preventing the spread of disease. The virus does not care where you are on the political spectrum. Right. So you want to stop the spread of the disease for the good of humanity. It's not a statement of your individual rights. You also can't drive drunk. That's against the law. You know, I mean, it's just the arguments are foolish and dangerous. But it's like you said, there's a, a preying on the ignorant. These the people that that fall prey to that rhetoric. I uh, they're not stupid. They're just ignorant. I mean, some maybe or I mean, I don't know. But uh, yeah, and it is frustrating, and that people prey on that is is astounding. But you know what? History has proven time and again that you say a thing loud enough, loud more loud than everyone else, and often enough, and it will become. The, the zeitgeist, it will become the truth of the, of the thing. Right. And that's, you know, 
And of course, with the internet, you can find your own facts, but there are no (laughs) alternative facts. There's only facts. And then everything else is misinformation or misguided or lies, deliberate lies that attempt to manipulate people. And there are certain things when you're dealing with public health and the public good, that when that becomes weaponized, as we have seen, it costs lives. It shatters economies. It does all of these things that there are certain things we ought to be in together. And Mm -hmm. when you can't, when the dissonance is so high that you can't even align around preventing disease (laughs) and over half a million people die as a result, that's really profoundly tragic. It is. Absolutely. But, you Uh, know. But it's not the first time it's happened either. And that's the, even there were anti-maskers during the play during uh, the 1918 pandemic. Right. That's it's it's there's always been the people that go against for either the sake of going against or because they've been convinced to go against. Yes, I think, you know, we can cut them a little slack from 100 years ago. You know, we know yeah, they didn't know as now. much science, of course, of course. You know, but you know, advertising to me too, it does rely on a smoke and mirrors. And I remember when I was in college, I took a fascinating course. Uh, it was a psychology of advertising, and we learned about how they put little skull and crossbones in the ice cubes of the drinks, or that they'll add extra body parts to model uh, shots of models to give the idea of, you know, more people like copious gang bangs and things, you know, it was really fascinating. And uh, the brain is easily manipulated, it seems, for such a complex organ. It is. And, and, and you know, uh, back when I was in seventh grade, I read a book called The Hidden Persuaders by Vance Packard. And it was absolutely fascinating and had a big effect on me because it was about advertising and everything from where, because I I just love thinking about things I had never thought about before. So it talked about why cereal boxes are brightly colored and why they are on lower shelves. And it's because the kids grab them. And so they then, you know, ready to make a scene in the grocery store or they like it because they saw it on, you know, advertising the cartoons in the morning or whatever. And, you know, all of these kinds of things that impact how we make buy decisions. Well, with the field of behavioral economics uh, and the two pioneers of that are Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. And uh, you may have heard of Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow. But they, he won the Nobel I, Prize. I think I have that book somewhere yeah, on it's my a, shelf. In that, that field of how we make decisions is absolutely fascinating. Uh, and one of my guests in class actually studied with Kahneman. And, uh, and he's a behavioral psychologist. Uh, and it's, it's just really interesting stuff. But, you know, going back just to that turning point when I was talking about the commercials at the Super Bowl was also Airbnb. Because it was about we accept. And all you saw was these rapid cuttings of all of these different ethnicities from around the world. And it was in direct contradiction to the immigration policies that were trying to be passed at that time. And so you saw advertising for the first time take political stands. And that's increased since then. So it's, uh, yesterday, Oreo tweeted that they were uh, part of the LGBTQ, you know, ally. Oreo cookies. You know, know. who thinks about that stuff when you're eating your Oreos? <laughs> really, you know, uh, and it's. I think it's just fascinating because that's yeah. what I was saying. Is that that a brand in their state of per, their statement of purpose? Uh, is so much more important now than it ever used to be. And there are companies, by the way that by all indications function and are driven by not only purpose, but integrity, such as uh, Patagonia. And Patagonia is an amazing brand that sets such a high benchmark for ethical behavior and where so many other companies will say they're sustainable. Arguably, Patagonia is one of the more sustainable, but they said, no, when you were encouraging consumerism, you are doing damage 
the point is to try to minimize the amount of damage. So we don't call ourselves sustainable. And, uh, you know, they, the person, uh, Vincent Stanley, who wrote the uh, Responsible Corporation with Yvonne Chouinard, who was the founder of Patagonia, he was a guest in my class. And it was amazing because they were thinking this way 50 years ago when they started. And it's just really cool. And now more and more companies are waking up because I think it's demanded by more and more of the consuming public. Well, what do you stand for? You know? Yeah, I agree. Integrity, I think, especially these days, is is very important, which is an ironic thing to say, considering if you look on Twitter for 10, uh, 10 hours a day, <laughs> integrity brain, isn't really... <laughs> yes, your brain will turn into a slushy if you do that. That's right. Yeah. One of the things that really fascinates me, too, about selection, and, and again, as it pertains to advertising... The idea that your brain has already made the decision before your mind knows it has, which boom on the, you know, that's, that's a crazy thought to think that you've already made the decision. If, if you go left or right, before, you know, you've made the decision to go left or right. That's some voodoo. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, in, and it's also just understanding you know, and understanding how we make decisions. And that's always being refined. I mean, one of the things that hits me, like with social media, all of the stuff that Facebook is doing, all of the stuff that Google is doing, all of the stuff and the way that the algorithms on Amazon are set up, all of this is geared towards making you buy more stuff. It's all about that. And, you know, it's like when I walk down the street in New York and you see in the grocery stores the signs with the letters this tall, I feel like the building's shouting at me that they're having a special on pork loins, you know, and it's the same thing online, all this incredible technology that my guess is could be put to far better use is all about selling us more crap that we don't need. Absolutely. Did you watch The Social Dilemma? I did. I did. What did you think? What did you think of that? Uh, I liked it. I thought it was very interesting. I mean, it wasn't anything I hadn't read about previously, uh, but I tend to read about that stuff. So I think for most of the public, there were revelations in there that they may not have seen. So I thought it was well done. Uh, and I think the messaging is really important to understand you know, what you're doing. But I also think that it's really important to look at antecedents and what happened before. You know, so I, I grew up in the television generation. And, uh, you know, you've heard of the Nielsen ratings, right? Yeah. So the Nielsen ratings is based on very few homes, the Nielsen homes, and they had the Nielsen box so it could record uh, basically what shows you were watching when. And that's where the Nielsen ratings would come out. Prior to that, Nielsen started on radio and they would put a wax cylinder in the radios, which were big pieces of furniture in those days. But when you tune a radio, there's this band that goes around this tube. And what they could tell is what the stations were that were most listened to by the depth of the groove in the paraffin that was around the cell tuning cylinder. OK, so it was much more primitive technology. Uh, and I was with Frank Stanton, who was one of the early founders of CBS with uh, William Paley. And he started off his career working with Nielsen, coincidentally, at the University of Wisconsin, where I went in Madison. They have the Nielsen Tennis Stadium because Nielsen went to college in, at the University of Wisconsin. And so I realized, wow, there are hundreds of billions of dollars of decisions made on what is essentially an arbitrary group of people that they believe are a representative sampling of a population. Well, poor people weren't part of that sampling. Black people weren't part of that sampling. So all the consumerism and so on was geared in a particular way. And, uh, it, you know, in television, and this is, I'm you're saying this because of the social dilemma, which I thought was really interesting and really good, but it's not new. Television made its money 
by selling its audience to advertisers. Right. That's how they make their money. So there was the perception that television was free, right? Well, it's not free. You know, you were giving up certain information, which is ratcheted up to the nth degree online in how you're tracked wherever you go and whatever you do. The goal is the same. How do we sell you more stuff? And how do we target you more specifically? Because there was a lot of waste in TV advertising, but it gets more and more targeted when you're online, really targeted when you're online because of the sophistication of the algorithms and so on. But if you are, if you think you are getting the product for free, what that really means is you are the product and you are being sold to somebody else. And in this case, advertisers. So that yeah, hasn't changed always, since radio. Yeah. It must have been trickier back in radio days because they didn't have the visual stimulus, right? They did convince you to buy a product based on what was being said. That's true, except that once you turned into a station, it wasn't until the, I think it was the early 60s, maybe, uh, that there were remotes, you know, and that you could program something, you could sit. 10 feet away and push the remote button. So with TV and before that radio, when you got to your favorite station, which you might've seen ads in the newspaper or so on, you just were kind of parked on that station and that's what you would listen to. So people weren't switching around all the time. Now, you know, it's like, you're just constantly. Well, there's a thousand stations back then. There was what, three or four, maybe ABC, CBS. In television. Yeah. Yeah. And NBC. And then PBS came online. And then the big change really happened with Turner Broadcasting when he was cable, but he went national. And that was that started changing up the game. So PBS was in it. uh, And then uh, things started really changing when cable started getting more distributed, which that whole history is really interesting, too. Yeah, it's all fascinating, all of it. I, I'm also fascinated by brands, not just branding, but brands and how there are hosts of people that aren't being paid to do it, walking around advertising other people's brands. That yeah. is genius. <laughs> no, you're right. You're you're right. You know, I, I and I thought a lot about that because part of what I teach is how to create a brand. And I thought a lot about that because, you know, when I was in, in high school and on the wrestling team, uh, you know, you get a letter. And so you've got your letter sweater or your varsity jacket or that sort of thing. And so there was, you know, the tribe that you belong to in terms of being an athlete or, you know, whatever. But back then, otherwise, your logos were on the inside of your clothes, not the outside. And then it's that started changing. Uh, bags started changing. For instance, you know, it used to be the brown paper bag when you bought stuff. Well, now wherever you buy it from has got their logo on the bag because you're a walking billboard for wherever you bought whatever you bought from. So shopping bags became portable billboards and people walked around carrying the shopping bags and you could see, oh, they bought that, you know, wherever. And so it's really interesting, you know, what captures our eyeballs, what gets our attention, what makes something familiar. Oh, I heard of that. Where did I see that? And that started in early advertising. The term, a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, When we got into having buses and streetcars and so on, and you would go past the storefronts quicker, they realized two things. One is you had to communicate faster. So you communicated faster with an image and just the store name. And the other thing is the vehicle. If it was a bus, you also had two sides of a bus. You could also sell advertising space on. So when people saw it go by. So I find all of that just fascinating how, how that all works and how that all works up here and, and influences the decisions we, the, we think we're making logically and isolated per case when just isn't this, that's not how it works. Yeah, I picture a dystopian future where humans walk around with the brands just on as tattoos on their bodies. And depending on placement, you get more money for that. (laughs) And that's how people live an opulent life because they've chose to put Nike on their forehead or 
Gatorade across their chin or something. <laughs> well, take a look at NASCAR. And it's a great example, yeah. And look at the uniforms, you know, and look at the cars. And you'll see that parsing out and selling of parts of the physical real estate for advertisers, right? So, you know, it's really interesting. And that's already here. They just aren't doing it directly on their skin. Yeah. Uh, but that that's already here. And somewhere there's an actuary that can tell exactly where on the car or on the body suit that's going to translate to X amount of sales and things. That It's crazy. Well, I was it's doing crazy that. how... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say I was doing uh, a project for uh, Ralph Lauren Golf, and we were working with two professional golfers, and they wore Ralph Lauren pants and shirt, but they wore a different branded hat, different branded gloves. So we were restricted on how we could shoot certain things because we just wanted to feature the Ralph Lauren part of the golfer, you know, and we didn't want to feature, you know, the Nike hat. Uh, and, but the condition of the athlete that they booked was whenever they appeared on screen, they had to be wearing that Nike hat. So, you know, it's interesting when you're selling those different parts of the real estate, it puts up sometimes other issues in terms of when, you know, you've sold another part of your body to a different advertiser. Has it changed you as a consumer knowing what you know? You, you know, you've looked behind Oz, you know what's behind the curtain. Interesting question. And the answer is yes, it has, because I'm thinking... God, people really fall for this because it seems so obvious to me, you know, so I've never, it's never become routine to me in a sense. I always think about what I'm doing, think about the impact that what I'm doing has and so on. And uh, I always respect the audience for what I do enough to try to give them something different. Like with Victoria's Secret, part of what I was, had a big part in was the personalities of the models. So you would see, you know, Adriana Lima, who was very funny. I made use of her personality being funny, you know, and that there were just different characteristics that would come out of the models. And I tried to do things that featured who they were and make them more relatable as people. So one of, one of the most successful campaigns I did for them was, uh, was Christmas. And so because of budgets, we had to get, you know, a song that was in the public domain and we did deck the halls. So first of all, they weren't in lingerie. They were in Santa help for Santa's helpers outfits. It was like something from the ice capades, you know, that, that kind of thing. And uh, I knew that I was dealing with models from Brazil, from uh, Holland, you know, from different parts of Australia. And they weren't all going to know the song. Right. So and the song is in the public domain, so it was free to use. And uh, it was funny because the models kept screwing up. And my client of Victoria's Secret said, oh, what are we going to do? They can't even get through the song. I said, that's the spot. They looked at me. What? I said, that's the spot. We're going to humanize them. They look physically perfect. And all the imaging of them is perfect. But we're going to show their people, too. And they get embarrassed and they make mistakes and they laugh at themselves. And we're going to do that. And so we did it. And that blew up. Uh, it was run on many national news stations, on Entertainment Tonight, on uh, you know Good Morning America, on the Today Show, in its entirety. And it was, you know, Victoria's Secret Angels are humans too. And all of this, and it just got tremendous publicity went hugely viral and it was just humanizing them and having fun with it. And initially yeah. the client was scared to death of it, you know, but uh, so I was able to do things because I had the trust of the client that would benefit the brand, but I also didn't pander, you know, it wasn't that kind of, of pandering and the models enjoyed it because it wasn't, I wasn't asking them to just keep projecting sexy. You know, this was all about fun. The umbrella stuff was 
fun. We did a football spot. You know, if you look through a lot of stuff I did, the models were not in lingerie. They were in football uniforms. And so it was quite different. And so, you know, I was very fortunate because the uh, woman that I worked with at Victoria's Secret, Monica Mitro, trusted me and gave me the opportunity to bring those ideas out. And they worked. But it's not like there was an opposition to them initially, because there sure was. Yeah, Each I, I like that, that you said you didn't pa- pander to them. I mean, they hire you for a reason. You know what you're doing. It's important to hold your ground. I'm, has it ever lost you a job? Uh, I mean, I, I there have been, there were jobs that I didn't take because it was clear to me that that if the fit was so bad in the first meeting <laughs> that uh, even though I had the job uh, and they came to me to do the job, that it would be a good idea to say no. And so there are those jobs that I have said no to, but I try to communicate clearly from the beginning what my intent is and what I do. So I fortunately don't really run into that much. I mean, you know, there's been over the 35 years I've been doing this, a handful, a very small handful of situations where, you know, that's come into question. I was talking with a friend of mine a couple of weeks back about ideas, the idea of ideas. And he said something that really struck me. He said, there's no such thing as a million dollar idea. There's only a million dollar action. And I thought, fuck, that's so profound. And yeah, that's true. I've had a million ideas that are like, that's a great idea. But how many have seen the light of day? Well, that's right. You know, uh, we've all had the feeling when you go into, uh, whether it's you go into a gallery or you go into a store and you see something and you see the price, I think, God, I could have done that. (laughs) Right. You've had that feeling. I'm sure we all have. (laughs) For sure. For sure. And then the question that I ask is, well, what's the difference between you and them? They did it. Exactly right. They did it. And that's the difference. And so you've got to get your ideas out there or they don't have any meaning. I mean, nobody's really interested in hearing, oh, you know, I had thought of that. I just didn't do it. Sure you did. Good idea. You know, uh, it only means something if you get it out there. And that actualizing the idea, I believe, is a creative act. I mean, I think entrepreneurship is a creative act uh, because you're taking an idea and if you actualize it, you've got a business, just like writing a song. Uh, Now, I may enjoy hearing the music more than I enjoy doing business with a particular company, but I think that the notion of creativity needs to cast a wider net. Because I think it's something that starts up here and then becomes a product or service you can offer. And that's a creative act. You know, it may not be a form of creativity you particularly care about, but I do believe it is a creative idea that leads to actualizing something that people can either buy or whatever. So let's get back to the play that you're writing. What made you get that going? Because many people think of great ideas for movies and plays and television shows that that they don't then put into. Obviously, you're the type of person that does put things into action, but that's a big undertaking. <laughs> it, it it is. If I knew how long it took to mount a play, I would have started when I was younger. <laughs> it's it's it is it, it is. Uh, I think that's why being naive in certain ways is a good thing because as you get older and you acquire experience and you can see the obstacles down the road and you can think, oh, I don't want to deal with that, <laughs> you know? Uh, but I felt like this was a really important story to get out there. And I think that Lloyd Price is an unsung hero in the world of music and in the world of civil rights and the world of entrepreneurship and all the things that he did because he was never a victim. Now, the way it came about was I had done a job for Radio City Music Hall. I did a film for their 75th anniversary. It was part of the Christmas Spectacular. 
And it, and it ended up being a part of it for like seven years or something like that. It was cool. The executive producer at Radio City, John Banani, a uh, really good man. He's the one that hired me and liked my ideas and, and kind of things I came up with. He left Radio City to go back to his love, which was theater. And uh, he said, I've got somebody I'd like you to meet. You know who Lloyd Price is? I said, Mr. Personality? Yeah, I know his music. And he said, well, would you mind meeting with him? I said, no, I'd love to meet him. That Cool. Okay, well, he and Lloyd met because they shared the same eye doctor. <laughs> and this is, by the way, how stuff happens. Yeah. It's not that you have a master plan and you go from step one to step two to step three to eventually, you know, hitting your goal. It's under that very scientific umbrella called shit happens. You right. know? And, and that's how stuff happens. It's not like you can plan that you're going to meet somebody that way. Uh, so they wanted me to do a short documentary about Lloyd because they wanted to start promoting a project about him. And uh, so I did my research. I interviewed him. I found his story so compelling and so interesting because I knew nothing about his life until I researched him before I you know, interviewed him. And uh, I said to him, I know I can capture your story. I know I can capture your voice. I want to write about you. I want to make this happen. So I wrote the first few scenes and kind of performed them for Lloyd. He really liked what I wrote and how I was approaching it. And it was funny. I said to him, you know, your story is bigger than you are. And he said, Jeff, I've been waiting for 10 years for somebody to say that to me because everybody has been blowing smoke up my ass. And he said, but the real story is I was the messenger. And this happened through me, but that passed through me. It's a bigger story about our culture and about race. And uh, so that's when it started. And, uh, and that's when I took on the project. And actually my meeting before doing your podcast was with my director, executive producer, and general manager, because, you know, we've, we moved the play from April of this year, 21 to February of 22, because I was just afraid that we would not be out of COVID and people psychologically would not be ready to go back to theater by the spring. We made that decision back in September. So we did move it. And so now, you know, we're rejiggering the parts and all of that sort of thing, but that's how the play came about. I didn't know anybody in theater. I didn't have any connections in theater. So I had to start from ground zero, but uh, I'm seduced by ideas. And if I really like the idea, I'll try to figure out some way to make it happen. And it's just that I have to be, frankly, I have to be more discriminant uh, because I have less time. I have less time because I'm busy. I have less time because I'm getting older. So, you know, I want to do the stuff that's really important to me and tell stories that I think are really important. And I think this is a really important story. Do you think you'll segue completely into being a playwright? Is that the goal or is it particularly the story? Uh, well, I know what the next thing I want to write about is. And, uh, you know, my, both of my parents died in hospice. And both of my parents were very funny, very warm people. And, you know, we all or the vast majority of us deal with the death of a parent. And there were many darkly humorous things that happened in hospice. But the people in hospice are astounding and humbling in their humanity and their empathy. And I want to tell the story about that, which is an entirely different thing, much smaller production, much more intimate. But, you know, I want to do that. Uh, and I don't know that I would segue totally into that, maybe. Uh, but, you know, also, it's I like keeping my production company going. But, you know, I don't know, because, you know, if there were the kind of offers and the kind of activity and it could generate the kind of revenue that supports my family, uh, you know, who knows? So 
I, I don't believe in making any kinds of definitive statements other than the statement, I don't believe making definitive statements because you don't know what's going to happen and you don't know what the opportunities are. It's just being open to them. Yeah. Are you a spiritual person, a religious person? No, I'm no. not. You know, I mean, I I'm, think- I'm, I'm a big believer in the humanity of others. And I think that it's really important to me to treat each other well while we are here, because there's no compelling evidence that it makes any difference when you're once you're in the ground. <laughs> you know, so I think we should. Uh, I've been asked on on some of these podcasts. You know, well, what's the best version of you? So this is kind of it. You know, there it's, there isn't like well, there is a better version if you can come back on Thursday. Uh, you know, and so I think the, the only spiritual aspect I have is in the belief of the, the respect that we should have for each other and how we treat each other, which is so eroded and which is so unfortunate. Uh, if you call that spiritual, but, you know, I I don't believe in in a I don't believe in the traditional notions of religion. I, I interviewed, raised, sorry, go ahead. No, I was raised Jewish. It's a part of my heritage and it's a part of who I am, but, uh, you know, it's, I'm not defined, uh, by religious beliefs of any sort. Yeah. I interviewed a, a Catholic priest, father Mike, and he said something that really touched my core, which was, it's unfortunate that so many people worry so much about building their mansions in heaven when they could be, you know, doing that on earth while they're alive and helping their fellow human and being a, a member of the human race. And I thought, wow, man. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I did a, a project some years ago for the Harvard school of public health. And I, met some extraordinary people and it was so humbling because you know what you know the, there was a particular person uh deeply touched me uh and uh you know and this happened by the way almost 30 years ago and uh she was this extraordinarily intelligent uh woman her name is Venita Rostogi, and she was a doctor and, uh, you know, graduated from Harvard, top of her class as a doctor. That means you can make a lot of money. And, uh, you know, if you go to Harvard Medical School or Harvard Law School, you're set for life. But she went back to school because she felt she was on the wrong end of the disease cycle. And she wanted to have a greater impact on a greater number of people in the public health. So she was valedictorian of the class and she gave her speech and, you know, she would be the first one on the ground in the mudslides and the storms and all these disasters that would be happening around the world. And uh, she was, it was humbling listening to her and what her life's purpose was. And it was, it was quite something. And the Dean of the school called me some months later and said, I know that you and Venita got along really well. I said, we did. She was amazing. And he said, well, she's dying. Mm. She has cancer. It's terminal. And uh, they had to remove the lower part of her jaw. And this amazingly articulate person could no longer talk. And uh, I wrote her a letter. And I got a phone call. And her husband said, uh, I read your letter to Venita and she wanted to hear your voice. And uh, so, you know, I spoke to her and just started crying. It was so uh, sad to me. Uh, Here's my non-spiritual side. I could write a list of a thousand people that should have died before her, (laughs) you know, and her, (laughs) her mission in life was so profoundly important. And that life was extinguished at such a young age. And it was so 
profoundly tragic to me. And uh, it was just, it was amazing. And so when you talk about spiritual and believing that in her, I guess that's a form of being spiritual because I believed in the power of her and the force of good that she brought with her as it was profoundly sad to me that she was eliminated so young. And I've always had problems with religion because it's not comforting to me to hear that the Lord works in mysterious ways. Work that mystery on some other people that ought to be gotten rid of then. <laughs> you know? uh, and let this person's life, which could have so much good as a result, continue. So I think that things, as I said, shit happens. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. But I think as humans, we have a compelling need to make sense of things, even if the way we make sense of things doesn't make any sense. Yeah, well said. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's why we find patterns and things that that's are right. arbitrary. Like like the Big Dipper in Orion. Like, like, or clouds for that in matter. When you see that's the right. unicorn in the clouds. That's right. That's As a right. painter, it's really I'm an I'm an abstractist, and uh, I have done performative painting where uh, people will be playing music, and I'll paint while they do their music, and people will walk by and things. And uh, it's always fascinating to me the adults see tragedy, and the little kids see so much joy in the same painting. You know. Yeah. I, I'll tell you a, a tag on to the Venita Rostogi story. So uh, I was writing for the Huffington Post. And, uh, and this was during the time when they were talking about the Affordable Care Act. And, and there are these articles coming out about, you know, how the best and the brightest would not become doctors if we went to affordable care and it was all horseshit, that's not true at all. Yeah. And what they also didn't, the writers didn't realize we're writing these editorials is the best and the brightest, which was a term that was a phrase coined by David Halberstam was used in ironic terms. He wasn't saying these people were actually the best and the brightest. He was referring to the Vietnam War, and he talked about how could the best and the brightest get us into such a futile battle. So I wrote about what how it was actually used in context, and then I wrote about Venita, because in terms of best and brightest, she exemplified that. I get an email from her husband, and this is now... 20 years later, right? And uh, almost 20 years later. And she had long been gone. He had remarried, had two daughters, one of them he named Venita. And he said he had started an educational foundation under her name. And could he use the editorial that I wrote as the introduction to their annual report? And I said, oh, God, I, I would be honored. If you did, absolutely, yes. And thank you for that. And he is a, gr a great guy. I never met him in person, but we had talked some years ago and then we had a conversation then. Jump ahead another eight years and I'm shooting in uh, Monte Carlo. And I get an email that I saw Victoria's Secret was doing uh, shoots in Monte Carlo are you here? I just arrived with my family. I would love to meet you in person and love my family to meet you. And I said, yeah, I, you know, I'm shooting till about 1130 or midnight. Uh, and then we leave the next morning. Uh, but I would stay up. I would love to meet you. Well, we got together at like 1230. We're together till about 2.30 or 3. And then he said, we'd like to come by and say, see you off tomorrow morning, which they did. And which was just so wonderful. And then it ended up two years later, he was in New York with his family and they were living in an apartment on the Upper West Side where we are. And so my family got to meet his family. We all had breakfast together. Mm -hmm. And I just loved 
the serendipity and coincidence and how all that happened was just really, that. really cool. Yeah. I'd like to read the article if you could send that to me. Yeah. Let me know uh, how to get that or just email it to me and, uh, or shoot me in the right direction and I'll find it. I, well, the, the easiest, uh, the easiest thing you can do is, uh, I don't remember the title. I think it's who are the best and the brightest. I'll send you, I'll send you a link and you might okay, actually, en- you might actually enjoy some of the uh, other articles. Uh, I'm sure I would. Uh, you strike me as a person I could hang out with quite easily. <laughs> <laughs> well, and likewise, thank you. Uh, you know, I I appreciate that. Jeff, how might people find you? What's the best way? And if they have questions for you, what's the best way to reach out? Uh, well, they can go to, i uh, give you a few things. There's the Creative Careers website, which is a creativecareer.com. And at a creative career is the Instagram site where I post clips of, of some of the interviews from my class. And uh, my book, Creative Careers, I have a visual aid. Yay. See? Hawken <laughs> Books, Hawken Books. Uh, Love it. And it's called Creative Careers Making a Living with Your Ideas at All Fine Booksellers. So you can buy that on Amazon or wherever. And then what the site that you looked at, which is my production company, which is madoffproductions.com. And you can go there uh, and see some of my work. And uh, also an Instagram site at Madoff Productions. And uh, then finally, and this is, I'll just throw this in since we've gone all over the place in our conversation, is on Instagram at Jeff underscore Madoff. I take post pictures every day as I walk New York and just shots of New York life, which I do for myself and just put out there because I love this city and it will be back after being really brought to its knees because of COVID and just the economic impact. Uh, And then ultimately on LinkedIn, I don't know why I said ultimately, it's not ultimately, but also also, uh, on LinkedIn, be Jeffrey Madoff, like you see my name on the screen. And I post clips from my creative careers class there and other things like that. Love it. Jeff, thank you. I have enjoyed this conversation very much. Well, thank you very much. Me too. I had no idea we would go into all of these directions. And I, I hope that that this is something that's good for your listeners. And that Absolutely. Well, this is conversation, right? There it. I, it's funny because a lot of times people say, well, do you want to read everything about me? And I always say, nope, I want to learn in real time because I think doing so allows us to go in so many different places. If I already have the answers to every question I ask you, there's no fun in that for me. I can't imagine that would be fun for my listeners because it would feel very rote, you know? Well, you know, I, I, when I, uh, I had booked your podcast and I read the blurb about it. And I don't always agree with everybody, you know, <laughs> I thought, okay, this will be interesting. And it's, it, and you are right. It's been uh, for me, just a wonderful conversation that you guided into a lot of different directions and I uh, totally enjoyed it and talk about things that I don't normally talk about. So uh, thank you happy. for that opportunity. Good. And I'm excited to see the play in, in uh, 2022. My uh, best friend loves uh, the theater and especially musical type, like the Jersey Boys and things like that. So I know she and I will be on the plane to New York and to go see it. I'm very excited. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. I'll take you backstage. <gasps> Wonderful. All right, good. <laughs> Take care and uh, thank you so much, Jeff and everybody. Thank you for listening. Bye. Rate and review Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.